Welcome to Healing Through Stories, Beyond Grief and Loss, with storyteller Tom Cosgrove. Thank you very much for joining me. You know, I'm a guy who's passionate about stories. I believe they've been a part of us since we could communicate. And we all have stories. We use them to share our fears and our dreams, who we were and who we want to be. Stories inform, they inspire, and hopefully they entertain. Tonight's stories are often taboo, at least in our culture. I'm talking stories of death, dying, grief, caregiving. But the funny thing is, they weren't always taboo. It's actually kind of amazing because in the same period of time where we went from having men banished to the waiting room during childbirth to being so intimately involved that I found myself having discussions of centimeters dilated with total strangers. <laughs> in that same span of years, we went from having grandma die in the upstairs bedroom to rarely witnessing death or even talking about it outside of a grief support group. We've embraced one end of the life cycle and ran from the other. Now, I am no expert. <laughs> I've got no fancy degree. I've got no peer-reviewed papers. All I have is my experience, which makes me not unlike many of you. So tonight, I offer you taboo stories in the hopes that it nudges the pendulum back towards the day when death was not divorced from the business of living. Earlier this year, my mother passed away. Roberta Jean Cosgrove North, but everyone knew her as Bobby. I was lucky enough to spend last Mother's Day with Bobby. I hadn't had that pleasure in many years. And she told me a story that evening about her childhood that I had never heard before. And here it is. Catastrophic. It could have been any complex word, but it was catastrophic. Bobby knew it was an important word. It was big with lots of parts. She had never been taught how to diagram a sentence or to sound out a word phonetically and now at 10 years old she had read a word far beyond her experience. She hadn't been reading the assigned children's book but a book with small print and no pictures. Catastrophic. Bobby was absolutely sure it was a dirty word. And if her mother found out, she'd be punished. So quietly, surreptitiously, she looked it up in the family dictionary and she found it. But she could not figure out the meaning or decipher the syllables. She could have asked another adult about it, but she was too scared. After all, she had been reading above grade level, and if that was common knowledge, it would lead to no good. For years, she would recognize the word and intuitively grasp its power, but she never asked an adult about it. At 86 years old, the word was still special to Bobby. They shared a history. On Mother's Day, Mom and I were out on the screened-in back porch. It was dusk, and I was reading to her from the novel The Storied Life of A.J. Fickery. When up popped catastrophic. And just like it always did, that word carried Bobby back to when she was 10 years old and the day catastrophic came into her life. Bobby felt this story illustrated her lack of courage in confronting the world. And it reminded her of paths not taken. But to me, this story captures the moment when my mother started her lifelong love affair with language a passion she passed on to her children, and now I share with you. <laughs> when I was a kid, I loved games. And I'm talking, this is way before PlayStation and Xbox. I'm talking about classics. Monopoly, Yahtzee, Parcheesi and Chess, Scrabble. Clue, Stratego. Now this is, was not just an idle waste of time. This was educational. Games taught me lessons of strategy and observation. They taught me how to win, 
They taught me how to lose, but most importantly, they taught me how to cheat. <laughs> and how to spot a cheater. Now my mom, she always supported me in my obsession. Ever since I could remember, my mother has given me games for my birthday. It's her way to hold on to her little boy. She still pictured me as I was at eight years old, frantically trying to keep up with the bingo caller while playing six, seven cards simultaneously. But the thing is, I outgrew games decades ago. Today I compete out there in the daily grind and the structure that I found comforting as a kid now drives me crazy. For years, I hinted to mom that I just didn't appreciate games like I did as a child. But mom, she was deliberately dense. But when I got Trivial Pursuit for my 30th birthday, I said, enough. <laughs> I decided to confront her when she called. Hi, Mom. Oh, hello, dear. Did you get my package? Uh, yeah, Mom, I sure did. And you know what? I really do appreciate it. But, you know, we need to talk. You know I don't play games anymore. I find them boring. I can't sit still to play the damn things. Oh, you so love games as a boy. I remember a time when all you wanted were games, and a time you didn't use that kind of language with your mother. <laughs> games continued to arrive. Every year, a few days before my birthday, a box would arrive, and inside would be smaller boxes, beautifully bound in wrapping paper with games like Uno and Pictionary. But things were different in my 39th year. Just five weeks before my birthday, we buried my father, William Devine Cosgrove. He had non-small cell lung cancer, even though he never smoked a day in his life. The cancer moved from his lungs to his brain, and he was dead within five months of diagnosis. He thought it was related to his travel on World War II troop ships. He would tell the story of avoiding the top bunk because the asbestos from the ceiling would leave a fine dust. I was extremely lucky to have an understanding employer. And so I took off and I went back to the Midwest and spent six weeks with my father as he died. He wanted to die at home, so we got involved with hospice. Now, I cannot say enough good things about hospice. They're compassionate and they know their business. They taught us the stages of dying so we knew what to expect. And they were eerily accurate in their pr uh, predictions at least most of the time. Toward the end, my father spent a great deal of his time in a semi-conscious sleep state. And when the visiting hospice nurse heard, to, heard what to us was the familiar sounds of his sleep apnea, the nurse declared that she could tell from his breathing that the end was near. My mom did not miss a beat. Oh, honey, you can't tell from that. He has sounded like that for the last 40 years. I'm from a large Irish Catholic family. I've got seven brothers and sisters. And all of us spent some time during this period assisting my father, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks. But I was there 24-7 for the last month and a half. I helped mom sort out the finances and make the medical decisions. Between house chores and nursing duties, we played cards, watched movies, and did craft projects. And we spelled each other during the long nights. A strong friendship emerged from all the pain. Now, during this time, I wasn't really deriving much comfort from my religious tradition. As a matter of fact, my father had always called me Doubting Thomas. I questioned articles of doctrine and faith. Concepts like the soul seemed far-fetched to me with no logical underpinning. So I started to read about death and dying, and I found particular comfort in near-death experiences. You know about this. Somebody experiences trauma. Their lungs and heart stop. They're clinically dead. But somehow, their lungs and heart start back up. When these people return to consciousness, they tell stories of tranquil feelings, seeing and moving towards the light, and seeing and hearing those that have gone there before them. And some report seeing the room as if they were hovering in the corner and looking down from above. Now, there are non-mystical explanations for this. There are those that say that the critical thinking centers of the brain shut down first, leaving buoyant thoughts unquestioned by a reality filter. That may be true. But all that mattered to me was that there was a chance for peace at the end. 
I am still very much a doubting Thomas. But there are now two things of which I have no doubt. Whatever was my father's life force, his energy, his soul, it was gone from his body before the physical machine quit operating. His heart was still beating. I could feel it through the back of my hand as it rested on his femoral artery. But his life force was gone before that heart stopped beating and his lungs stopped pumping. And as I stood there feeling his final heartbeats, I had a vivid image of my mind of my father hanging in the corner and looking down and seeing me and my mother and brother, sister and uncle all surrounding him and touching him. And I could feel his peace, something that had eluded him in life. And the second thing, my father visited me weeks after his death. I was back in Juneau and racked out in bed and kind of in that zone between wake and sleep. And I heard my father clear his throat. Gah, he had a very distinctive way he cleared his throat. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. I could feel his presence at the foot of my bed. I couldn't look, but the presence was tangible. And slowly, it dissipated. I found out later that visits from the deceased are commonly reported across culture and religion. Being with my father in death fundamentally changed me in lots of ways. For one, I glimpsed what the Buddhists call being in the moment. I was vividly alive with urgency and focus. Everything else fell away unimportant. It was real life, up front, no filters. I was more alive while assisting my father to die than at any other time in my life, including the birth of my children. I discovered strength I never knew I had and now understand love in an entirely different way. For me, it was profound. And a mere five and a half weeks after all of this was my birthday. Remember my birthday? It was rapidly approaching and I had received nothing from my mother. No card, no box, nothing. And then the day before my birthday, a letter arrived. I didn't open it right away. As a matter of fact, I put it on the kitchen counter and just let it age. I, I just couldn't deal with whatever weirdness it contained. But finally, my curiosity overcame me, and I opened that letter, and I'd like to read it to you right now. Dear Tom, we've traveled far since your last birthday, and I feel we are both stronger for it. Even in the depths of depression, I discovered strengths, and by allowing myself to be exposed, I know I'll arrive at a comfortable place. I hurt quite a lot sometimes. Sometimes I just ached to touch your father's hand. His hands were so strong and safe. But I'm grateful for 42 years of his caring love. I'm also grateful to you for caring enough to see me through the hard times. And I know it was painful for you. But you provided strength when I was weak, humor when I was sad. You listened when I talked and understood when I cried. You accepted my depression as normal for my circumstances, and you refused to let me shut myself off. But I'm writing to wish you happy birthday. I remember how much fun it was to have you as a child, and what a challenge you were, and still are. <laughs> have a happy birthday, and thank you so very much. Love, Mom. So you see, there were no more games for my birthday. Mm. Caregiving. It was everything I feared and nothing I expected. I think there are a few jobs that are harder. I was asked to do the most difficult and disturbing things I've ever had to do, like spoon feeding someone who'd spoon fed me and changing his diapers. I think I'm like most family caregivers. I was reluctant. Did I really want to be there? 
No. I, I wish I had been anywhere else. Colonoscopy, root canal, cleaning out the garage. But was I willing? Hell yes. Absolutely, totally willing. And for me, it appealed to my inner risk taker. It was my chance to see life's last big adventure. I had to be there. Years later, when I was assisting my mother in her illness, I realized that it wasn't just death that made the experience with my father profound. It was the caregiving. I got much more out of caregiving than I ever put in. And when it's my time to need care, I hope the experience has prepared me. Because I know I'm going to remember being reluctant. But I hope I remember just how uh, willing I was. And I hope I have the courage to ask for exactly what I need, no matter how difficult. My father died almost 20 years ago. And soon after that, my mother was diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy. Her particular set of symptoms was gradually diminished use of her hands and feet and steadily increasing pain. She described the pain as electric and burning. Most people with this affliction survived decades through the massive use of painkillers. My mom, she tried every type of pain therapy there was. She did drugs, she did acupuncture, she did chiropractic, spinal stimulation, bee sting therapy, and prayer, always prayer. All of these approaches provided some relief, but most were short-lived. So I should not have been surprised when on one of her annual visits to Juno, she asked, Tom, will you buy me some pot? <laughs> now, this was years before medical marijuana, but people in her peripheral neuropathy support group swore by marijuana's benefits. And when she found out that she could take it in baked goods rather than smoke it, she was ready to try. She just wanted to be someplace far from home where she could hide it from my siblings. <laughs> I agreed to help without reservation. And I made some phone calls and I found someone who could supply what I was seeking. On the agreed upon day and time, I knocked on a door and I was greeted by someone that I'm going to call Delilah. <laughs> Delilah was an aging hippie that had a long gray braid that ran down her flannel shirt. She owned a very productive line of pot plants for which she had a pet name. But let's just call it Samson. <laughs> Delilah wasn't really a drug dealer or someone who grew for her own use and to supplement her rather meager income. Now, she definitely dealt in cash, but she was always up for barter. You know, firewood, fish game, car parts, tools. She invited me into her little kitchen and sat down at her table and started to weigh out pot on her Weight Watchers scale. How much are you looking for? I told her why I was there, what I was going to use the pot for, and she stopped. Whoa, you're going to use Samson's Primo Bud for cooking? Uh, yeah, that was my plan. Oh, no, that is just wrong. That would be a waste. This is for a quality smoking experience. <laughs> uh, so you're not going to sell me any? Nope, no way. Uh-uh. But. I happen to have exactly what you need. She went over to her freezer and opened it up and pulled out a frozen chunk of something about the size of a cantaloupe. Marijuana butter, perfect for your baking needs. <laughs> now you probably already know this, but THC is the active ingredient in marijuana and most of that is concentrated in the bud of the plant. The other parts of the plant left over after harvest, the stems, the stalks, and leaves, they also have THC in it, but at much lower concentrations. And oftentimes that stuff is just tossed after harvest. But Delilah is the child of Depression era parents, and she is frugal to the core. So she takes those leavings after harvest, renders them with butter, strains out the particulate matter, and what's left is phlegm colored butter with green flecks. <laughs> she handed me about a three pound chunk. So I'll tell you what you do with this stuff. Whatever the recipe calls for in butter, you replace it with this butter, and I will guarantee you that mom will get high. The problem with this stuff is the concentration really varies, so some batches come out a lot stronger than others. You just gotta experiment. 
Well, I mean, she really did sound like she knew what she was talking about. So I pulled out my wad of cash. Mom had given me $150 in fives and tens because it was harder to trace. <laughs> but Delilah just shook her head. Put your money away. I've got lots of this stuff, and it's for your mom, for God's sake. I'd hope you do the same for my mom. So I ended up back at my place with mom and three pounds of phlegm-colored marijuana butter, whipping up brownies and laughing. Our first batch was half marijuana butter and half regular butter because mom was afraid of having a bad trip. <laughs> she decided to take, the, take it right before bed because I told her that many people get sluggish on pot. She ate the brownie in small, deliberate bites, said it tasted like dandelions. <laughs> the next morning, she reported having slept better than she had in a long time. Seems that the marijuana took just enough edge off the pain to allow her to fall asleep. She was giddy with the prospect of a decent night's sleep on a regular basis. She had thought she had found her answer, and you know what she did? Almost. But it wasn't long before pot effects started showing up. She got dopey. She got dizzy. She fell once. But it was when I walked into the kitchen and found her standing at the stove, staring at the frying pan as a grilled cheese sandwich burned, <laughs> that I knew. Mom, I don't think this is working out. I know. I know. She was beyond disappointed. This was just another glimmering promise of pain relief that proved too good to be true. Just like all the others, early success was crushed under the weight of nasty side effects and diminishing effectiveness. I had told mom all about Samson and Delilah and Delilah's generosity when I returned her wad of small bills. And now at the conclusion of our experiment and she being a proper lady, she insisted on writing a thank you note. <laughs> now I told her the protocol prevented me from telling her Delilah's real name, but she was determined. She sat down and wrote a beautiful thank you note in her, in her Catholic school cursive and addressed it to dear madam. I delivered it to Delilah weeks later and watched as she read it. And I could see tears in her eyes. And she said, I have been supplying pot for people for over 20 years, and no one has ever written me a thank you note. <laughs> we were back at my place, sitting around at my tiny table, having a cup of tea and recounting our adventure. When I said, you know what? I never thought I'd be out scoring pot for my mom. And she started to cry. And I'm not talking about a few tears. I'm talking deep, racking sobs. Mom, mom, stop. I'm just kidding. Please don't cry. But she just shook her head. And when she could talk again, she said, Tom, I am so sorry. I never thought I'd be so desperate that I would ask a son of mine to risk arrest, imprisonment, and loss of reputation. <laughs> this, I have, I have put myself ahead of my children's needs. I was blown away. To me, this whole thing was a lark, a great story to tell. To her, it was the ultimate failure as a mother. The pain had overwhelmed her motherly instincts to protect. She was devastated. I tried to console her. I said, Mom, look, there was little chance of arrest. And even if I had been arrested, who's going to prosecute a guy trying to help out his sick elderly mother? And as far as my already tarnished reputation goes, <laughs> something like this could make me a folk hero. <laughs> Mom, whatever risk there was, you were worth it. I was glad you asked, thrilled that I could help out. But she was having none of it. And for years, she apologized to me for putting me at risk. 
it made me realize how hard it was for her to ask for help. She was once a vigorous, contributing member of society, and she excelled at one of the hardest jobs of her era, raising a large family, and she did it with style. Memories of her being strong and active hadn't diminished in her mind. She still saw herself as she was 20, 30, 40 years ago, and not someone needing help with the most basic tasks. I realized that asking for help takes letting go of who you were, and accepting who you are. And that takes courage. This story has an epilogue. Delilah is still around. I contacted her when I started developing this story and she told me she still has mom's thank you note and has it prominently displayed. <laughs> My mom had peripheral neuropathy and remained in pain till the end. But as these things go, within this past year, her doctor recommended THC pills for her pain. <laughs> she was reluctant, understandably, until he said, God put that plant on this earth for a reason, and I believe it's to help people like you. She took the pills and slept much better. And she agreed it was time to tell this story. Most of us collect more than one story about loss. So you know, these are powerful stories. They touch on some of our greatest fears and challenges and life's biggest mystery. And these stories, they need to be told. If we keep them bottled up, they can be corrosive. They're central to grieving. I discovered this in the year after my father's death. Now, you would think a guy who spent so much time with his father toward the end wouldn't have any unresolved issues. Well, if you avoid all the old arguments in order to keep the peace, guess what? You end up with some loose ends. <laughs> so I dug into grief, reading and studying, and lucky you because you're going to enjoy the fruit of my labor. <laughs> I am going to provide you the cliff notes of grief, everything you would have remembered if you had taken a grief class in college. Are you ready? Common metaphor for grief is a river. On that side of the river, my loss was so overwhelming, it was with me almost every waking moment. And on this side of the river, I still have a loss. I still have a hole in my heart, but the difference is, the grief no longer controls me. And the only way from that side of the river to this side of the river is through the river. There are no bridges, there's no ferries, there's no shortcuts. The only way to cross that river is to immerse in the grief. My way to do that was to tell my story. And when I was honest to that story, I found myself back there again, feeling those emotions. And afterwards, those emotions had less juice, less energy. The grief had less power over me. Now, I admit this is kind of counterintuitive. And I mean, there are lots of people who are like, are you kidding me? I went through that once, isn't that enough? It's better to forget the whole thing. The problem is, is that doesn't work that well with grief. If you ignore it, it can fester and affects other parts of your life, like your health and relationships. If you ignore the grief, the grief still has power. You're not on this side of the river. The first time I told my story was to a grief counselor with my head in my hand, my eyes on my toes, and crying. It was then I learned the truth of the old saying, what soap is to the body, tears are to the heart. But it's not only professionals who are willing to listen to these stories. As a matter of fact, there are lots of people who are willing to listen. You probably already know some of them. They're the people that ask, how are you? And really want to know the answer. I think anyone can be a listener. Sure, it might not be your thing, but for me, it's made death less mysterious and more natural. It's hard, it can be, it's emotional, and you gotta be totally present. You can't be thinking about like what's for dinner. But the thing is, 
you don't have to worry about what to say because guess what? You don't say anything. All you have to do is listen. If you want to tell your story, I believe you can find a listener. And it doesn't even need to be anyone you know. Sometimes a perfect stranger will do. My father died in the late fall, which happens to be my least favorite time here in southeast Alaska. <laughs> Dwindling light and constant rain. So in the years following my father's death, I would take off and go back to the Midwest to help out my mom. I'd do chores, rake leaves, and sleep outside in the backyard in that warm, dry weather. So I was often traveling on the anniversary of my father's death. Not that it has anything to do with the following, but gosh, it has made me wonder. I was at SeaTac Airport on a weather delay and sitting on a bar stool at a pub located at the start of Concourse C. I'd gotten caught in a snarl caused by an early season blizzard. The pub was jammed. I was just sitting there eating bar mix and looking at the nonsense on TV when I saw a guy come in the bar, come in the pub there. He was looking particularly wrung out, and he had a, had a jacket over his shoulder. Now, it just so happens that one of the few spots open in the entire place was the bar stool next to me. I motioned to him to come over. This stool's open. It's uh, yours if you want it. Oh, no kidding. That would be great. I really appreciate it. He piled up his luggage and sat down and ordered a beer. We just sat there shooting the breeze when at some point I said, looks like you're traveling on business. No, not business, uh, family funeral. Oh, that's a drag. One of your parents? No, thank God, I still have both of my parents. It was my brother, motorcycle accident. How'd that happen? After that, I just listened. He told me the story of his troubled baby brother. Drugs, alcohol, bad relationships. Unfortunately, a story that many of our families share. Drinking, an argument, a late night ride, a missed turn. His was the story of an older brother racked with guilt, wondering if he could have done more. He told this story with his hands on his pint and his eyes straight ahead. And when his eyes started to wander, I turned away, and soon my eyes began to tear up. And then there we were, two 40-something guys sitting on bar stools, looking straight ahead, not saying a word, and literally crying in our beers. When I went to pull out my bandana to watch, wipe my eyes, I caught the time. Oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. I think I shocked him, but obviously not too much because his hand shot out and grabbed my check. I got this. Hey, thanks. No, man. Thank you. And as I ran down Concourse C, blowing my nose and wiping my eyes, I thought, why was I in that pub at that moment with the only available seat right next to me? And you know what? I never even asked his name. Just a few years later, just about the same time of the year, I was on the last leg of my journey home. I was on an Alaska Boeing 727 somewhere north of the Queen Charlotte Islands. It was after the evening meal and drink service and they had dimmed the lights and people were dozing off. Now I'm a restless traveler. I always get an aisle seat if I can. And in the days before it was a security risk, I would walk the aisle from the unreinforced cockpit door back to the aft bathrooms and back again. On this particular transit, I went past the bathrooms and into the back galley. The two flight attendants were sitting on their jump seats, reading magazines and chatting. They knew me from my wanderings and just nodded and smiled. I staked out a spot on the other side of the galley near the exit door, and their conversation continued. It wandered amongst the mundane until it focused on the first class flight attendant. I can't believe she's back so soon. Yeah, if it was me, I would have taken more time. She says it's better than staying at home. Yeah, but it's only been two weeks. 
The first class flight attendant had recently lost her husband. You know her better than I do. Have you talked to her about it? Ah, not really. I told her I was sorry. Yeah, I never know what to say. It was happening again. I hesitated, but not for long, and I jumped right in. Excuse me, I, I, I couldn't help but overhear, and, well, I have some experience in this area. Sure you do. <laughs> they were unsure, but I plowed straight ahead. I gave them my whole rap on listening and told them how important it was for her to tell her story, no matter how often. And I had no sooner finished than in comes the first class flight attendant. Her name tag said Sheila. The flight attendants did some work banter, and then as if on cue, one of them says, Sheila, I am so sorry. It must have been terrible. Were you with them at the end? And Sheila was off, recounting the mercifully short but painful descent to her husband's death. Now this moment, for me, is frozen in time. It's burnt into my memory, or whatever metaphor you want to use for a memory that never fades. Three flight attendants and me, standing in the back alley of that Boeing 727, riveted to Sheila's story with tears coming down our cheeks. When she finished, there was an awkward pause. And when I looked up from wiping my eyes, all three of them were staring at me. <laughs> and I knew it was my time to go. I turned to Sheila, my condolences, and I made my way back to my chair. After we landed in Juneau and it was my turn to exit, Sheila and the pilot were standing next to the open cockpit door saying their goodbyes. I nodded to the pilot and then looked to Sheila. Sheila had mist in her eyes. And she didn't say a word, but she stepped forward and she kissed me right on the cheek. And man, did that get the eyebrows on the pilot to go up. <laughs> I believe when Sheila looks back, she will remember the back galley of that Boeing 727 as one of the places where her healing began. But wait, there's more. Just this past year, I was once again at Seattle Tacoma Airport checking in for a flight. I checked on available seating because I was stuck in the back in a middle seat and I was looking for anything better. And guess what? Ha! I scored. I got an aisle seat near the front and the, and the middle seat was open. I mean, it just doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> now, I got to take a moment here to explain something to the non-Alaskans. Concourse C at the Seattle Tacoma Airport is like an Alaskan suburb. <laughs> we're, we're a huge state with a small population, so when you get on Concourse C, it's not unusual to see familiar faces. And when you get on your flight, you're bound to know any number of people. So there, sitting in aisle seven on the window, was Vic. Vic is an acquaintance of mine from Haines, which is the next town north of Juneau on the Alaska Marine Highway. Now, Vic isn't really a friend. He's not an enemy either, but we had had a number of exchanges over the years that were less than positive. All in all, I would have preferred a stranger I could have just nodded at and ignored, but there we were. We were civil and polite and all that stuff, but it was clear that neither of us wanted to engage. People were still getting on the flight when Vic's telephone rang. It was his girlfriend, someone that I have known for decades. Hey, hey Chanel, how are you? Yeah, I, I just sat down. I'm gonna have to turn this off pretty quick, but you can't believe who's sitting next to me. And then I proceeded to listen to his part of the conversation. Uh-huh, really? No, 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 no. Okay, all right, I will, I promise, I, I promise. Love you, bye. <laughs> Chanel says hi. <laughs> uh -huh. 
says we should talk. <laughs> Chanel had caught this show when I performed it in Haines, and we'd gone out for pizza afterwards. She had been with her father when he died, and we talked of her experiences. Chanel says we should talk, huh? What about? My mother died. Oh, man, sorry to hear that. Are you just coming back from the funeral? Uh, no, uh, the funeral won't be for a few days. Um, she just died. Just? Yeah, just this morning. Less than eight hours before, Vic had held his mother's hand as she died. For the next two hours, I listened to Vic's story of his mother's death, the love that his father had for his mother, and the story of his own near-death experience and how it's shaped who he is and what he believes. By the time we were on approach to Juno, the conversation had dwindled. But the energy between us had noticeably shifted. Now, I doubt we're ever really going to be friends. But I think we enjoy something now almost as good, and that's respect. If you're open and willing to listen to stories, you will have opportunities. And if you want to tell your story, listeners are out there. Just don't overlook total strangers and those from which you may be estranged. I want to uh, share with you some famous last words from someone who changed our world. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple. Steve was famously quoted once as saying that death is most likely the single best invention of life. In his final moments, he looked to his family and then out far beyond and said, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow. Open up to death. It just may change your life.